Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Accelerate Decision Making with Real-Time Analytics on AWS. So my name is Ryan Nienhuis. I'm a Senior Product Manager at AWS, and I'll be the speaker and moderator for today's webinar. With me, we'll have several of our great partners at AWS, uh, from Databricks, Brian Durking, from MemSQL, Mike Boyarski, and from Zoom Data, Sam Diner. We'll start off with a quick kickoff of sort of what we think about real-time analytics on AWS and an introduction to our partners. Uh, and each of our partners will go through the various offerings that they can provide you for real-time analytics on AWS. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So what is streaming? And I, what, it, what does it mean to, to real-time analytics? So all of the solutions uh, included in the last poll have a streaming component to them. For Apache Spark, it's Apache Spark streaming. Uh, Apache Flink is a continuous stream processing engine. Amazon Kinesis is a set of core streaming capabilities uh, on AWS. But what does that mean to real-time analytics? Um, so when we talk about streaming to customers, uh, what we like to do, uh, what I like to say is, um, it's not necessarily the specific data that makes it streaming. It's what you do with the data that makes it streaming. So there's a lot of data that's, in fact, most data is continuously generated, um, be it video data or log data um, or clickstream events coming from a website, a mobile phone. Uh, it's continuously generated. What makes it streaming is acting on that data now in real time or near real time instead of waiting. And the, a good example that I provide for this is, uh, is, say, if you have an Apache web server or um, an EC2 instance or something along those lines, and you're logging information about either customer behavior or your applications. Um, what makes it streaming is if you can, as the data is continuously generated, you continuously uh, send it to a durable storage mechanism like Apache Kafka or Amazon Kinesis, process it continuously in real time, and then either react to it or persist to it to a long-term store like, say, a data lake or a data warehouse. Uh, what makes it the same data not streaming is for example, if you were to write the data to disk and uh, wake up a scheduled job every couple hours to send the data to some centralized storage system. Uh, or if you were to periodically update a database maybe every couple minutes with new results, instead of streaming that data and then updating that database in real time. So that fundamentally makes, uh, when we talk about streaming data, that's fundamentally what we're talking about. And there's a lot of examples from it. I mentioned application logs, but streaming uh, solutions are very popular in, uh, for video security and home camera feeds, for IoT uh, sensor data, for click streams from mobile devices and um, uh, websites. So it's very popular for a lot of different uh, areas. So there's a simple pattern that I want you to think about as we go through and each of our partners go through uh, each of their solutions and offerings in the real-time analytics space, especially as it does, uh, relates to streaming data. So you can think of it, there's a data producer. I mentioned a bunch of them um, on the last slide. That it continuously creates the data and what, it's the first step in the sort of the streaming or real-time analytics pipeline. And it continuously writes that data to a stream. Uh, you can use a streaming service like Amazon Kinesis, which would durably ingest those messages at high volume efficiently reliably stores the data and it provides this temporary buffer. Apache Kafka is another phenomenal example for what you could do for this middle layer, this streaming service. The key is that it supports very high throughput efficiently uh, and provides that temporary durable buffer. And the second piece is a data consumer. Again, the continuous word, we're continuously processing data as it arrives on the stream. Uh, these data consumers will do everything from very, very simple buffering, so turning small raw records into larger files before persisting it to a destination like Amazon S3 or HDFS so that they can be consumed more easily by batch processing tools, to performing real-time machine learning and visualizations and leaderboards. And you'll see a lot of examples today with our partners uh, covering that. So Amazon offers a set of streaming services underneath Amazon Kinesis at AWS. Uh, the four services that we offer, first, our Kinesis Video Streams is our newest service. It was recently launched at uh, reInvent last year. It allows you to capture, process, and store video streams in real time. Uh, the core use cases for it are things like ingesting home camera feeds, uh, security cameras, uh, uh, 
uh, these types of things. And not only does it allow you to capture and store that data, but it also has good integrations with Amazon machine learning services. So you can do things like image recognition. Amazon Kinesis Data Streams is our uh, earliest service. It allows you to capture and process and store those data streams. And from the last slide, it's the middle layer. It's a core infrastructure product that a lot of AWS services use, uh, a large number of AWS customers use to basically uh, connect the dots between a high volume data stream and downstream uh, AWS analytics services. Kinesis Data Firehose is a, the second service that we launched under the Kinesis family. And it solves a specific problem with uh, very, very well. And that's how do I move data from point A to point B? So uh, there's no code required. You uh, write data at a high volume to Kinesis Data Firehose and then configure your Firehose delivery stream to deliver data to a configured destination. Uh, the destinations we support are Amazon S3, Amazon Elasticsearch Service, Amazon Redshift, our data warehouse service, and Splunk. And what you can do is you can configure different parameters associated with the delivery, things like encryption, compression, even performing simple transforms on the way from uh, generating the data at point A to delivering the data to point B. Uh, requires no code, no application. The primary difference between it and Kinesis Data Streams is Firehose is, provides a lot of uh, removal of complexity. Uh, there's no need to write any code, uh, but you lose some flexibility when you use it. Kinesis Data Analytics is the last service uh, that I'd like to mention, and it's a SQL-based product for writing uh, real-time queries that operate continuously on Kinesis Data Streams and Kinesis Data Firehose. And the easiest way for me to describe what the service does is to come up with an example. So as an example, if you would like to stream clickstream data from, say, your mobile application and uh, compute uh, live leaderboards, um, so uh, how many web, how many uh, views and clicks am I getting on specific pages or specific parts of my page, and then react to that in real time. Uh, maybe change your ad strategy, or maybe in real time, as a customer comes in, if they follow a specific uh, pattern of viewing your website, you give them a promotional ad, uh, that type of thing. It's really about reacting to the data as it's being generated. So uh, very similar sort of example that I just provided with Kinesis Data Analytics. Let's just walk through end-to-end uh, uh, -end example of what real-time analytics would mean in the streaming context. So imagine loading a social media uh, stream from Kinesis Data Stream. Uh, We'll, the Kinesis data stream will ingest and durably store that data, making it available for real-time processing. Um, one example of a consumer is a Kinesis data analytics consumer, uh, but there's a number of other open source libraries. Apache Spark Streaming is one of them. A number of our partners provide them uh, for generating hashtag trends on those uh, data in real time. You might use an AWS Lambda function to load, uh, which is our serverless compute um, service, to take that SQL result and write it to a DynamoDB table, updating a specific item, which then feeds a real-time dashboard. And Amazon uh, DynamoDB is our NoSQL database offering. All of these integrations are very, very seamless and easy to build. Uh, so are the integrations with our partners. So uh, th this is just one example of a uh, possible solution that you would build for social media analytics. We have a lot of customers building real-time solutions on AWS. The one specific example I'll call out is Redfin, uh, which does real-time home recommendations. So as users browse, uh, Redfin is a uh, home search and discovery tool, is also a real estate company. Uh, one of the things they do with Amazon Kinesis and real-time analytics is to uh, ingest a customer's behavior on the website and provide that customer based off of their search criteria, as well as their um, their website browsing patterns, provide them with real-time home recommendations with the end goal trying to find the home for the consumer that they want to uh, purchase or are more interested in. But the only other comment I'll have on this slide is you can see that these uh, real-time analytics and streaming examples, they're covered across a wide variety of verticals. Uh, and it's because turning raw data into information quickly is very valuable to any business. As we go through the, uh, the partner presentations, it's helpful to sort of um, understand where in the stack each of these partners play. So you can see that uh, on the left-hand side, we have that the pattern that I mentioned, the data producers, and then a durable storage for collecting that data, like Amazon Kinesis Data Streams and Apache Kafka. 
a lot of our partners offer solutions for durable storage as well as processing and analyzing and they each have their own uh, value proposition around that of how you can build your own real-time analytics solutions um, on AWS using these partners. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to our first presenter, Brian from Databricks, who's going to talk about accelerating innovation with big data and unified analytics on Databricks. Great, thanks, Ryan. At Databricks, let me just get my slide here. There we go. At Databricks, our vision is to accelerate innovation by unifying data science and engineering and business. And we provide the unified analytics platform, which is powered by Apache Spark. Databricks was founded by the creators of Apache Spark, and we contribute 75% of the open source code, um, 10 times more than any other company. And we've trained more than 40,000 Spark users on the Databricks platform. So if you're not familiar with Spark, and it looks like you know, over half of our audience is familiar with Spark, but if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's widely recognized as the top engine for high-scale computing and analytics. Let me get my, there we go. Sorry, too many. So Databricks is a cloud implementation of Apache Spark that's been optimized by the team that originally created Spark. And Databricks has run on AWS since its inception. So what you see on this slide is a subset of many customers running Databricks on AWS. And as you can see, they're in a lot of different industries and they have many different use cases. Um, many of these different industries are using streaming analytics for things like streaming IoT, where you want to be able to uh, have devices stream back data. In some cases, that can be used for a use case such as uh, maintenance, uh, being able to, you know, to watch for when a, uh, an item needs to be uh, replaced and when it's starting to fail. Um, another example is intrusion detection and security. You know, a lot of folks are using Databricks on AWS for being able to determine uh, different types of attacks that are coming in or, or even physical uh, events where people are uh, intruding. And so you see a lot of different streaming examples there uh, in those industries. So while everyone's excited about the capabilities of AI and machine learning, you can't take advantage of great analytics models unless you can get the data. And Spark was the first analytics engine that truly unified data and analytics, enabling data engineers to perform ETL tasks and data scientists to create analytic models to run on one engine. And the Databricks Unified Analytics Platform increases the productivity of these teams by providing a collaborative workspace. So data engineers and data scientists and, and business analysts can work together on notebooks, iterating on data sets and models to perfect them quickly. You know, when you think about how you do analytics and the people that are involved and how much the question that you're trying to answer changes as you go through the process of, of working on a particular problem, you know, where you find some data and then you find an answer and then suddenly you say, hey, we need to get this other data set over here for more context. You know, we need to pivot our question a little bit. Um, and you think about that process and how quickly you can do that if everybody's integrated together in a single notebook where they can see each other's work, they can comment, they can make changes you know, real time, and then they can see results. Um, that's really a huge part of, of the productivity that we see in the data science teams you know, increasing by at least four to five X. So then with the click of the button, you know, you can take those notebooks and schedule them as jobs. So you're enabled to, to immediately go into production with the same work. And the Databricks runtime is an optimized version of Spark that increases performance and reduces total cost of ownership. Uh, Databricks serverless and auto scaling can add and shut down clusters as needed. So if you put in a job and that job's going to need to scale up significantly and then scale back down when it's done, uh, Databricks takes care of that for you automatically. So this allows data scientists and data engineers to focus on where they add the most value um, you know, by, by being able to focus on the problems that they're trying to solve. So all this integrates with AWS security and compliance, allowing you to really reduce risk as well as part of this process. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, streaming and, uh, and some of the process that goes on here. Um, in the Databricks runtime, you know, we support the AWS connect, uh, Kinesis connector as a source to read streams from. Um, there's a number of different processes that we have that allow you to, to take that data apart. So even if your uh, Kinesis records map to you know, an Apache Spark data frame with named columns and associated types, 
You could select the desired payload from the Kinesis record by accessing columns from the resulting data frame and employing the data frame APIs. So as one example, if you have a JSON encoded you know, set of data, you can use the data frame API uh, method as a cast to the JSON data and deserialize your binary payload into a JSON string. And then you can go ahead and take that string and, and run different SQL utility functions. So it helps to, to really know that, that Kinesis schema and then how it maps to the data frame and allows you to really stream that uh, ETL, um, stream that data in, um, whether your data is simple, such as words, or structured and complex, such as nested JSON. And then just as important as understanding the Kinesis record and its schema is knowing the right configuration parameters and options to supply in your Kinesis connector code. So things like uh, functions that we have, including like the stream name, the initial position, the max record per fetch, are you know things that you would commonly see that allow you to determine exactly what strings or sections of the data you're trying to to get, and so you can find out more about this and how this works in this blog post. Uh, bitly slash db kinesis um, takes you through a little bit more detail about exactly how uh, Databricks works with streaming data. So I wanted to talk a little bit more before I close it out about some of our customers and their use cases. Uh, Viacom in particular here, um, they're leveraging streaming data through the Databricks Unified Analytics platform and, and they needed to be able to optimize video streaming uh, experience. And so as they're streaming out video, they're also getting data back in a streaming uh, method in terms of the experience the customers are having. Um, and quite often what would happen is people would have problems where, you know, video was buffering or they weren't able to, to see the video or it would freeze up on the, on the readback device. And so using Databricks, they were able to start to understand things like rerouting the data to different you know, servers in order to get it to uh, optimally to the customer. And so they were able to improve the quality of their service by 33% and they improved their customer retention by 5 to 7x. So we see Databricks used in many web and uh, customer analytics use cases, as you see here on the slide. With Rulala, they were able to uh, reduce their ETL time by 60% and accelerate their model training by 25x. Um, you know, so what we see over and over is improvements in how, how much data can be processed, where organizations before using Databricks weren't able to process their entire data set in a timely manner, and suddenly now they can, they can do that. Um, how much more productive the teams are because they don't have to manage things like clusters, and then uh, how they're able to iterate faster in a collaborative environment so they can accelerate innovation, which is you know, really the goal here. So uh, for more information, go to databricks.com slash AWS, uh, and you can learn more about uh, how Databricks runs on AWS. And with that, I will pass it over to Mike. Awesome. Uh, excellent. Thanks, Ryan. And uh, this is Mike Boyarski from um, MSQL. I'm going to talk to you today about the uh, database platform for real-time analytics. Okay, great. Just a quick overview of MemSQL. If you have not heard of us before, we are a company that's focused on enabling any company to become a real-time enterprise. And part of that is our unique capability of essentially unifying a database and data warehouse workloads into a single uh, application or single environment. So we are a top ranked database and data warehouse by uh, Gartner. And so part of this has uh, come through the experience of our founders. Uh, they did meet while at Facebook working on distributed data processing uh, platforms. They also spent some time at uh, Microsoft on the SQL Server database. And the result is uh, what we have to date is customers that really span the spectrum between being digital or web native companies. This is in Pandora, Uber, Pinterest, but also larger enterprises that are going through a digital transformation initiative such as Comcast or Kellogg. Uh, these are companies that are essentially using real time for advantage. So, to get into the, the structure and, as, and sort of the understanding as to why MemSQL uh, delivers value to organizations, we have to spend a little bit of time on some of the challenges that we commonly see. Uh, the first is that the slow query execution is typically one of the big pain points most database uh, uh, users uh, experience. So whether the query response of their reports or dashboards are slow, uh, maybe they're not getting live data into their views, 
Um, another challenge is the data loading process. A lot of uh, databases that were designed 20, 30 years ago were designed for batch loading or batch processing. And so the ability to do sort of real or continuous loading ultimately locks or slows down the performance of those environments. Um, and lastly, we also see a lot of concurrency limitations. The, the, the reality is that as more applications are driving data, supporting data, the number of users that need to connect to those databases is, is increasing. And the result of that is when you add more folks to your database, you typically experience a slowdown or you have to throttle that environment. So these are sort of the three core sort of challenges that we see a lot of customers facing. And so what, the, what we have designed and what we're focused on here at MemSQL is the ability to do these three things really well. And this is ultimately the sort of why organizations look to MemSQL for their data management problems. The first is the live loading. So the fact that you can uh, be able to stream data into a relational database. And, and at the core, MemSQL is a relational SQL driven database. And so the ability to do live loading of your data without impacting performance of existing queries, existing user access, et cetera, uh, gives you that ultimate view of data that's happening uh, throughout the day. Um, this also gives the ability to do uh, on-the-fly transformations because we support and are optimized uh, in memory as well as optimized for disk. We have this unique capability of doing live transformation of your data as it lands into the system. Um, and that's uh, one of the, the key advantages of our platform. The, the other attribute is that uh, scalability is a big part of distributed systems, and that's something that MemSQL supports natively. So we are a scale-out distributed platform. The result of that is the ability to support a number of concurrent users or concurrent applications that need access to this data. So scalability, distributed processing, all powered by SQL, is something that is uniquely uh, a characteristic of, of MemSQL. And lastly, also the ability to handle transactions. So the, the, in many real-time workloads, we see the need to do updates, uh, you know, uh, deduplication of data, uh, transactions of the data in real time, but then also concurrently do queries, do analytic lookups, uh, group buys, et cetera, of the data as it's, as it's landing into the system. So it's the combination of these two workloads in a single scalable system that gives um, MemSQL its, its key advantage. And lastly, performance. The fact that you want to get your queries, your results as quickly as possible. Uh, scalable SQL is possible in this new sort of architecture. And so that can deliver to you a real-time experience, whether it's dashboards, reports, et cetera. Just a couple of our customers in terms of the scale that they're seeing with MemSQL, Kellogg saw a 20x faster ETL processing uh, improvement by essentially eliminating the ETL process entirely and moving all of the data into our in-memory engine and doing transformations there before landing it onto their disk-based architecture. Uh, Pinterest ingesting a lot of data throughout the day for A-B testing of their uh, advertising campaigns. And lastly, Akamai doing a number of uh, uh, updates, inserts, uh, 6 million per second. This is for a billing application, and this allowed them to go from weekly billing into daily billing. So I wanted to quickly outline uh, a traditional approach that we see a lot of customers embarking, uh, and I noticed that many of you are in the planning phase of your real-time uh, projects or real-time analytic projects. It typically has this flow where you have your data sources, your events landing into a transactional system, whether it's a uh, Aurora or, or uh, Oracle or SQL Server. Uh, in some cases, that data is then pulled or uh, uh, parallel loaded into a Spark or Kafka or Kinesis environment where you can transform and then load that data again into different data stores, whether these are data marts, whether this is a replicated data uh, or uh, operational data store, or even a data lake. And then from here is where you get your uh, analytic view with your uh, BI tool of choice. What we see typically is in terms of two areas of, of challenges is that the loading of the data from the message queue into a database is batched and or slow, and therefore 
we see a number of data mark proliferations or data store pro proliferations to avoid some of these bottlenecks. And that creates cost, complexity, uh, challenges in terms of uh, replicating data throughout your organization. The other challenges that we see when you access and want to do queries of your data, those query results are slow. They take, there's bottlenecks because the environment may be getting updated continuously and or the fact that you have multiple users that want to have access to these systems and they're running into concurrency issues. And so what we see now is a more streamlined architecture and a more modern approach to real-time uh, uh, analytics, and that is using uh, the combination of Kinesis and or Databricks, Spark, uh, or Kafka, loading that data into MemSQL and then consolidating your data stores into one scalable system. So one relational environment that can manage all of your uh, end user needs as well as provide that transactional consistency, uh, durability, and then ultimately the query performance that you want uh, for your end user. So this is where we see uh, scalable SQL providing the ultimate benefit of simplification, uh, consolidation of your data stores. Uh, when you have a scale out architecture, you can ultimately support the different workloads that may be required across data science, uh, data analysts, and or other applications. Um, so this is the ultimate benefit in a scalable environment. And then lastly, our high performance queries, the fact that we can deliver uh, because we have a column store engine that's inside of MemSQL that gives you really fast analytic results. So we can query, we've just showcased our benchmark of, of scanning a trillion rows of data per second. And so we're very, very proud to showcase the power of MemSQL through our analytic performance. I also want to just finalize by highlighting one of our customers in InfoSwift. They're taking advantage of uh, MemSQL, Amazon AWS, uh, to deliver a, a, a managed, scalable IoT analytics solution. And in this case, they're helping agriculture cu customers uh, optimize their costs and improve crop production. And so the reason why they chose MemSQL uh, and Amazon was to deliver fast IoT analytics with a price performance requirement in mind. So they didn't want to uh, see proliferation of data stores, and they really wanted to optimize cost. They wanted to also maintain their expertise in uh, their uh, SQL uh, uh, expertise as well as the MySQL uh, interoperability. We do support the MySQL wire protocol, so for those applications that are written, uh, to MySQL, we can seamlessly work with those applications. They also wanted reliability, so they, the fact that they had changing workloads and changing um, uh, sort of performance characteristics, and they, they needed a platform that could scan, span to different sets of uh, workloads, and that was something they could get with their distributed platform of MySQL, as well as AWS. And lastly, they needed rich SQL. They needed the analytics that uh, their end users needed, and that is uh, relational SQL is always the best way to get the best type of analytics from your data. And some of the technical benefits, just to summarize, is that they were able to see uh, ingestion rates that met or exceeded many of the sort of NoSQL environments that are very popular for their high ingestion, high transactionality performance. Um, they saw 10x query performance improvements over uh, competing solutions, so again, that Analytic performance is just as strong as our update performance. And then the data compression was something that they really appreciated because of the volume of data that they were storing. So we saw, they saw uh, data compression through our column store engine being very efficient. Um, and then the transactional consistency, they needed accurate data, some of this being financial related data, very important to have transactional consistency uh, of your data store. And lastly, because this was running on Amazon's platform, they were able to see the scale-out uh, provisioning that they uh, needed to adopt to the changing, again, conditions of their customers. So the ability to quickly and rapidly scale up and down their environment that made this solution a great fit. So hopefully that gives you all a good overview. If you've got any questions, by all means, submit them into the chat box. Um, and I will now hand it off to Sam, who's going to give you all a quick run through of Zoom data. Well, thank you very much. Um, my name is Sam Diener. I run uh, Strategic Accounts Technology for Zoom Data. Uh, so what I've done for you today is to 
uh, build a, a demonstration using uh, some of the technologies in our, in our partner ecosystem. Uh, obviously, the Amazon Kinesis uh, streaming framework as well as MemSQL. And what Zoom Data allows for you to do uh, is from a, a visualization standpoint, be able to see and take action on data that is in motion, right? Be able to take a look at not only the data that's coming in, but look at historical data, be able to act and then uh, move forward on that, and then to be able to share those insights with other people. So once again, the, the demonstration that I'm gonna show you today uh, is built using an Amazon Kinesis uh, pipeline with synthetic e-commerce data. Uh, the data is gonna be streaming in through Zoom Data Server, uh, running and landing in MemSQL, which is, as you know, a high performance read and write store. Uh, and then it's gonna be showing in Zoom Data in an interactive environment. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead without further ado and, and jump into that demo. All right, and you should all be able to see my screen uh, now. Uh, so what you see is a, a Zoom data dashboard uh, showing a hypothetical uh, environment of uh, bringing in synthetic transactions from an e-commerce store. You can imagine an Amazon.com or an eBay or a Shopify or something like that. Uh, and the idea here is that you have data that's coming in uh, live uh, and you're able to see real insights as soon as they, as soon as they hit the system. This is obviously a much different approach than your batch approach to looking at analytics on your data. Uh, you don't have to wait a week to get your historical trends, uh, what happened in the, in the store, uh, and, and wait a week for that type of insight. You don't have to wait on your analysts to turn through uh, the, the information that's coming in for you to be able to make decisions. And so Zoom data allows you to see these real-time streaming pipelines uh, in real time. And it also allows you uh, to work on billions and billions of records of data as well. Uh, today, the focus is real time, but there's also this, this capability in Zoom Data to work on billions of records, upwards of 10 to 100 billion records. Now, the idea here is that Zoom Data is displaying what's happening in the underlying data store. And you can see that there's a time bar at the bottom that shows us exactly what's happening. You'll see that the, the data is coming in live and the, 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 chart is, the charts are up, updating simultaneously with all of that. Now, the idea is that I might want to be able to not only look at live data, but I might want to be able to, uh, to pause this, this input and be able to rewind the, the playback uh, and be able to see exactly what's happening on my data as well. Now, you'll see that so you'll see that you have the ability to uh, not only play the data that's coming in live, but you also have this ability to rewind and play back the data as it happened. So it, much like you would take a, a DVR at home, record uh, your favorite NFL football game or, or college basketball game uh, or uh, reality TV show, you're able to rewind the data, to rewind the, the playback and, and make that appear live uh, once again. So if you think about the ability to work in a network operation center or in a bank and be able to not only take a look at what's happening live, but be able to go back historically and see what happened over a previous time period, that capability also happens uh, and is available with Zoom Data. Now, Zoom Data is not only focused on showing you what's right in front of you on the dashboard, but also allowing for you to be able to interact in multiple different ways. So for example, let's say I wanna dive deep into this data. I see that the science category is selling a lot. What I can do is that I can click on, on any given point on the, on the visualization, and I can either zoom down into the data, I can look at the individual aggregate details, uh, I can look at a trend, and I can do this either on historical data or live data. Once again, billions of historical records or real-time data flowing through a Kinesis pipeline uh, into MemSQL. And so what I'll do is I'll, I'll pause this. Let's say I wanna look at the, the science data as it exists between uh, the two times on the time bar. I can go ahead and click on the zoom button, say, okay, I wanna drill down and look at, for example, the SKUs being sold in the science category. And then I can see those individual SKUs. Then I can, for example, highlight that, those, a specific set of SKUs and drill down even further and take a look at the zip codes where they're being sold, right? All of this on data that I've literally paused that was streaming two seconds ago. 
right? The, the power here to be able to make decisions from this this insight is 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 unbelievable. And so then I can get down to really any any record and look at down at the individual record. So what I've done is I've gone from a streaming set of data, uh, been able to rewind, play it back, but then also been able to pause it and, and look at the data at a time period and then isolate the records that are creating a trend for me. And so this ends up being a very powerful set of functionality. Now, as I said, this is not just for real-time streaming data. It's also for, uh, for historical data uh, and, and many different big data types of sources. Uh, but that is what I wanted to quickly highlight in my demonstration today. So to wrap up on, on Zoom Data, so Zoom Data is a, a modern BI tool set uh, specifically focused on modern data. We are optimized, as I said, for, for big data, for streaming, and for, and for search sources. Uh, and we can join lots of different data sources together uh, across, uh, across different data warehouses. Right? We allow you to work at the speed of thought and allow you to do interactive analysis on huge data volumes. And we don't require you to move the data out of the underlying data store. That's actually something I didn't mention. The idea that is that you don't wanna batch move data from system to system, and we talked about that earlier today, but Zoom data connects to the data where it lies, leaves it there, and then provides it back into uh, the, the interface without ever doing any replication. So that allows you to scale your, your infrastructure underneath the visualization layer without ever having to do duplicate scaling in the in the uh, visualization layer like you were having to do previously in BI. We are a microservice. We run on the prem on premise or in the cloud or in hybrid environments, and we're very very easy. We're very easy to embed as well as to extend into other environments. So with that, I'm going to pass that back to our to our moderators uh, to go ahead and take questions. Great. Thank you every uh, for each of the partners that presented. It's very very informative. Uh, and thanks, Sam, especially for braving uh, a live demo. I know those things can be pretty difficult. So we're now going to transition into our live Q&A. Uh, as a reminder, you'll be able to submit any written questions through the questions panel. In the event that we are not able to answer your questions today, we will follow up with everyone individually via email. So with that, uh, there's a lot of questions that I tried to answer while we we're going through um, the uh, while the other partners were speaking. Uh, one of the things that I want to elaborate on um, is I would love for uh, um, uh, Databricks, Brian from Databricks, to speak about uh, integrating Spark or Spark Streaming with Kinesis and or Kafka and what that looks like on the Databricks platform. That sounds like Ryan might have some uh, difficulties, so we'll move on to another question there. Um, this one's good for uh, Mike. Um, so, Mike, uh, one question that came in is, any historical data stored in Zoom data, or is this just a visualization tool uh, that third-party store? And I basically it's good for Sam, not Mike. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question one more time? Sure thing. Uh, any historical data stored in Zoom data, or is this just a visualization tool connected to a third-party data store? Uh, yeah, so, so it's a great question, and thank you for that. Uh, the, the answer is that the, the data is not stored in Zoom data. We don't do any data movement. Uh, and so historical data is stored in, in infrastructure that is meant to uh, store lots of data, whether it's Hadoop or MemSQL or something of that nature. And so by leveraging the power of, of those, uh, you end up being able to have a much lighter uh, UI framework. What I would caution you uh, with is that many dif different tool sets do that, say that they're able to connect and work with these next generation data stores, and they're not optimized to work with uh, these next generation st stores. So they might have a JDBC connector that issues standard SQL to those underlying data stores, and that's not the way that those data stores were meant to be queried. So Zoom Data, what we did was we built up uh, queries or built up uh, connectors from the ground up uh, and really made sure that everything that we connect to is optimized in a way that uh, most tool sets don't, don't take advantage of. Thank you for the question. And here's another good follow-up question for you, Sam. Um, so how is, in your words, is Zoom data different from Tableau? Uh, yeah, so what I would say is, is there's a lot of, of architectural differences as well as UI differences, uh, probably too many to go into today. Uh, what we see is that uh, we succeed where other BI tools fail. So very frequently what we're, where we're coming in uh, is that a, 
an organization has tried and tried with Tableau to get performance, to get scalability, and it's just not worked. Uh, this happens in many banks. It happens in the federal government. It, helps, it happens in health quick care. And we just repeatedly hear, uh, you know, we can't make Tableau scale in the way that we want. And that's both from, a, from an architectural standpoint, from a UI perspective, but also from a pricing standpoint. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm happy to have a, a deeper uh, conversation with the the uh, the question the question the person asking the question, uh, and I encourage that person to reach out to me. Okay, thanks, Sam. So here's your question for uh, Mike at MemSQL. Um, so what is the data storage? Um, is it using MemSQL or AWS storage? Yeah, so the, it, it um, that's a good question, and it kind of depends on where the data flow is is uh, processing. So ultimately, the the data can land and be stored on uh, Amazon's S3, uh, EBS, et cetera. MemSQL, when we're running our queries of the data, when we are structuring the data, uh, we recommend an EBS uh, uh, storage environment. That gives you the best performance, and that's something that we see our customers needing. Um, so it's, it's a sort of dependency on where the performance requirements are and what you're sort of looking for from a, an output to your application. Um, but in, ter in terms of today's discussion, I think uh, with MemSQL and, and the examples that I showcased, those were uh, EBS-based uh, stored uh, uh, da data files. Perfect, and I guess a follow-up question for you too, Mike. Um, do you have connectors from MemSQL to Kinesis? We do, yeah. We work with, uh, with Kinesis uh, streams and are able to, we have a a uh, customer in, in Disney that's showcased their application at Strata, uh, San Jose. I highly recommend, um, you know, looking at that uh, that presentation um, where they're using Kinesis landing into MemSQL for uh, managing media delivery to their to their end customers. Uh, I guess this is a question for maybe both uh, Mike and Sam. Uh, can you connect Zoom data directly to Databricks, Kinesis, and or MemSQL? Uh, and then do you offer connections for Redshift? Uh, so this is Sam. Uh, so uh, yes to all of the above. So we can connect to a, a wide variety of data sources. And, and that those, list, those connectors are listed on our, on our webpage at zoomdata.com. If uh, you want to discuss that further, I'm happy to, happy to take that offline. Yeah, and from the MemSQL side, we can ingest data from a variety of sources as well. Um, in terms of live loading, you know, we, we recommend a, whether it's a Databrick, uh, whether it's Kafka, whether it's Kinesis. Um, and then in terms of further sort of loading into other environments for other uh, applications and requirements, we can also um, support, you know, loading of, of data for from Redshift environments. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, we're we're a JDBC ODBC compliant interface that can load data from uh, a variety of sources. Okay, sounds good. And we have more questions coming in. Um, uh, someone asked a nice general question of how um, how ADBS and partners work together. Um, I think this is a good opportunity for maybe each of like, uh, Mike and Sam to kind of summarize how you guys um, partner well with AWS and kind of uh, how the process works. Yeah, so I'll start here. This is the, on the MemSQL side. So we, um, you know, roughly 30 to 40 percent of our customers today run on an AWS environment. Uh, many of those customers are taking advantage of EC2 instances, uh, taking advantage of the, of the various uh, managed service uh, uh, components from there. Uh, we also have a, a marketplace uh, version of our product. We we recommend downloading our product from our from our website at memsql.com slash download. We have a, a 30 day trial there and that can be, uh, we have some quick starts that can help you deploy uh, memsql to uh, AWS uh, environments. Um, and this is all in an effort to just streamline and, and, and accelerate the provisioning and use of, of memsql uh, on, on the AWS platform. Um, and then again, we have, uh, pretty proven technology and that we've been uh, battle tested with a number of significant customers that take advantage of the, the AWS platform. Yeah, and uh, this is Sam from Zoom Data. Uh, we uh, are able to deploy in an AWS native environment uh, and we connect to a wide variety of the, the different data sources uh, that are uh, built for AWS. So. Um, we have a number of customers who are using Zoom Data up in the up in the cloud. 
uh, and we um, have a lot of success in that environment. Okay, okay. and I have uh, another couple questions for you, Sam, um, about more connectors. So can Zoom data connect directly to um, uh, DynamoDB, or does the data have to move, be moved through something like uh, S3? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, it kind of gets to a little bit more of the, the technical architecture behind Zoom data. Um, and the way that Zoom data works is that it issues specialized SQL to the underlying data store. Uh, and so uh, we require a data store that handles or can, can uh, process that type of uh, SQL uh, query. And, uh, and there are some extra mechanisms to redirect uh, in that SQL query that we issue into uh, data source specific language. Uh, what we found with connecting directly to DynamoDB is that it doesn't support uh, those direct queries. So we've usually integrated into uh, something that does have a, a query engine, whether it be uh, Presto on top of S3 or, uh, or Redshift on top of S3 or something of that nature. Um, you know, on top of that, uh, with regards to connecting directly to S3, uh, or or uh, storage I at rest. Um, the 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 problem with with that approach really tends to be that uh, it it goes against Zoom Data's core operating concept, which is to leave the data in place. Now, if you think about trying to achieve performance on data that's stored in a uh, a non-structured way, like it is in S3, for example, uh, then you have to figure out how to get performance somewhere. So by connecting directly to S3, the only way to do that would be to ingest that in the Zoom data uh, and, and suck all the data in, which goes against our, our core our core kind of core uh, belief that we shouldn't move the data. And in a case like that, you might use something like Athena, which is able to uh, do high performance scans of S3 and then provide us the data that we need. Uh, so we, we do have some models for connecting directly to, to Dynamo. Uh, we do have a model to connect directly to S3, uh, but we have some some interesting ways to scale and be even more performant. And, and, and once again, a deeper technical conversation probably would follow, and I'm happy to have that offline with the, the question asker. Great, and I guess a, a good follow-up question to that is, um, do you have connections directly to Kafka, like KSQL? Uh, yeah, so that's something we're efforting at the moment. Uh, you know, the, 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 the question, uh, obviously becomes whether you keep Kafka as a as a data storage layer uh, or if it is in fact just a pipe right uh, what we've always thought of of Kafka as as being is more of a pipe and you know this case SQL uh, uh, part of their technology uh, really does give more credence to the the, the fact that this might be moving towards the storage layer uh, what I would say about uh, connecting to the pipe is that you obviously don't want to uh, drink from a fire hose, right? So Zoom Data is a UI tool, uh, and we uh, we tend to try to focus specifically on on working with manageable chunks of data. Uh, the, the real time visualizations that I show you uh, showed you operate off of a uh, an architecture that is specifically crafted to allow visualizations to occur on that real time stream. So uh, I guess the short answer to your question is yes, we, we we're working on some connectivity to KSQL. Uh, the second part to that is that connecting directly to Kafka is not something that we uh, tend to do. We generally see it go through a streaming pipeline or Lambda type architecture and land it into something like MemSQL, and then we connect to it. Um, and I think we have time for about one more question. Um, so, Mike, um, how does uh, MemSQL compare to other NoSQL scores like uh, Dynamo or MongoDB? Yeah, sure. The NoSQL um, and, and MemSQL, there, there's uh, some some differences and then some similarities. So the, the similarities are that we're both uh, distributed, so scale out architecture, uh, so you can do a lot of parallel processing of data. Um, the, the main difference is that we're st uh, a relational structured environment. So uh, a lot of customers will say, well, wait a minute, I have JSON data, and can you really put that into a relational format, and how does that work? Uh, MemSQL does support JSON as a as a data type, so that's something that we can very efficiently store as a as a in our col in our column store environment, and then you can do uh, clever things around turning that into a computed column for analytics. Uh, the reason why structure and the reason why relational is great for many applications is that you can do real analytics. Uh, some of the NoSQL environments doing analytics requires 
different layers and different sort of uh, SQL-like uh, syntax. And we are an ANSI SQL database, so we provide sort of the scalability and performance of a NoSQL store, but with the, uh, uh, st the structure and uh, analytics of a relational data store. So that's sort of the, the synopsis there. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, so I think that's all the time we have today. Um, so again, anyone that didn't have their questions answered live, we will be able to uh, answer via email. A really big thank you to all of our speakers uh, for taking the time out today. Thanks, everyone.